Canadian. Work boot jeans, I mean DNA, not denim. Original work boot pattern used in the trenches. Can you get any sturdier than this, well, daintily finished boot? How you going? Welcome back to my channel, Bootlosophy. If this is your first time here, my name is Tech and I come to you from Western Australia and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands around where I live and work, the Wajuk people. This is Viberg's Stitch Down Service Boot, so classic that it is trademarked. This pair is about a year old, pre-loved, and I bought them from my friend Eli, uh, who's on Instagram as the Heritage Tribute. Thanks, Eli. If you could hold this in your hand, look at it closely and wear it for a moment, you will see and feel that it is an extremely sturdy boot, which I'll get into in the review. And yet on screen, in images, even at a distance looking at it, you'd be forgiven for dismissing this as a dainty, effete, fashion-forward boot. You'd be wrong. It may be built with the care and focused attention on the finishing like a better quality fashion boot, but this has Weiberg's work boot DNA all over it. Let me try and convince you. The Weiberg service boot, or to be exact, the stitch down service boot, was created by founder of uh, Weiberg, Ed Weiberg, in the 1930s as a work boot for miners. The pattern was based on a Canadian military boot and was reintroduced in this updated style by grandson Brett Weiberg. It has the classic 21st century service boot attributes. It has an over 5 inch shaft, a low block heel, open uh, derby or derby style of lacing, basic four piece pattern of vamp, uh, two quarters and a one piece backstay covering an external heel counter. This one is plain toe, but you can get Viberg service boots with a cap toe and with brogue cap toes. This one is in uh, one of their classic makeups that they call Essential on the 2030 last and in brown chrome XL. And in this Essentials collection, you can also get black, color eight and natural chrome XL, as well as in uh, three shell cordovan colors. Then they also offer what is essentially the same boots in increasingly varied and exotic uppers from quality tanneries like Charles F. Stead from the UK, uh, Mariam from Italy, and Tochigi from Japan. Apart from varying between toe cap, broguing at the toe cap, and plain toe, they also uh, use both day night and Ridgeway soles on this 2030 last, as well as on their Munson style 2040 last, their round toe 1035 last, and their boxy sprung toe 310 last. A last, by the way, is the 3D mold around which the maker stretches the uppers around to create a boot with different shapes for different lasts. Having that many lasts for this boot can be mind-boggling to decide what last is good for you. And uh, Dave from the Vintage Future uh, YouTube channel did a really good explanation of the different Viberg lasts on his channel. Uh, I'll leave a link to the Viberg website down below so that you can see the variety of service boots available for all tastes. Just using a different upper and outsole, uh, even on the same last, can create a different look and feel to the same boot, as you can see from my review up there, uh, of the same boot in oiled culata leather and on the Ridgeway sole. But before we go on, let me just talk quickly about the brand Viberg in order to give you some context to what I'm about to tell you. Weiberg is a Canadian company and, as I said earlier, founded in 1931 by Ed Weiberg in Saskatchewan before moving to British Columbia in the West. Starting by making farmers' work boots in the wheat and cereal cropping province of Saskatchewan, the move to British Columbia's logging country also meant the introduction of logging boots, uh, boots for miners, and from there, boots for forest fire fighters. Uh, still, Viberg family owned today, the third generation Brett Viberg has the reins. Uh, it was in fact Brett that recognized the need to transition into markets outside of work boots, using their existing work boot construction methods into a line of dressier casual shoes. 
In the late 2000s, his visits to Japan caused the realization of the Japanese Americana heritage trend, and he regenerated the original farming work boot with an old Canadian military last into the Weiberg stitch down service boot. It's not unfair to say that Weiberg was the first in his now crowded space of American heritage style service boots, and soon other brands and more recent direct to consumer brands followed. As for their work boots, they still make them. But clear in their marketing strategy, the Viberg.com website only carry their casual everyday collections and their work boots are on a separate website altogether. So, starting from a work boot DNA, how are these everyday service boots made? As usual, I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. The construction method is stitch down, in which the uppers of the boots are sewn together, lasted, and on the last, the bottom of the front half of the uppers are flanged outwards to stitch them down to the sole construction. You can watch my video uh, explaining the different, uh, different construction methods uh, up there. In this double row stitch down, one row of stitches is sewn through the flared out uppers to the leather midsole, and the second row stitches through the uppers and midsole as well, and then through to the outsole. That outsole stitch continues past the flared out uppers uh, on the midsole all the way into the heels. The heels themselves are glued and nailed to the 5mm thick midsole. This is an extremely durable and water resistant form of construction, also used by all the American Pacific Northwest work boot makers like White's, Nick's, JK, Frank's. But while the construction and even the hand, uh, hardy materials used are the same, the stitching on Weiberg uh, is done by a company that clearly is experienced in making sturdy boots in a very refined, delicate, dainty manner. Take a look at this photo of the difference in the stitching between these Weibergs and a pair of Nick's boots. The stitch density is precise and even and way higher in count and the precision of the consistent and straight lines of the stitching is obvious. That's not to say that the Nick stitching is bad. <laughs> That's not to say that the Viberg stitching is better or more durable. All that says is how Viberg uses the same methods but applies dress shoe manufacturing attention to detail. Now Nix isn't going to fail any faster. Viberg's isn't any less robust. But I know which one my brain will tell me to wear to a fancy event and which one my brain will tell me to go digging in the garden with. As I said, the construction connects the uppers to the outsole through the veg tanned thick leather midsole. Uh, the outsole is from English manufacturer Day Knight with the ubiquitous studs, each set in a shallow depression for grip and ease of knocking off dirt, yet maintaining a low profile for dressiness. You will see Day Knight on almost every brand's collections and it is grippy enough except under the worst or wettest conditions. The heel is stacked leather with a daylight top lift. Inside the boot, between the insole and the midsole, is now a layer of cork, but sometimes in the past there was a hard foam. If you watch a YouTube video of the Division Road Viberg Factory Tour 2020, you will clearly see cork being applied. Yet, on the Cobblers Plus channel, you can see the foam being pulled out of a pair uh, that's being resold. There are others. If you're patient and do a search, you'll see uh, at, at quite different times, cobblers finding cork and foam uh, when they're being, uh, being rebuilt. I know that in early 2021, Viberg put out a Facebook post saying that they were consciously starting to use all natural materials. And there may have been a gradual change to cork, which some of the cobblers are uh, yet to see uh, since they're repairing older boots. I was actually accused of lying in an earlier review by a viewer, something I have never done in a video. He was adamant that uh, they used foam, but I suspect his fact that he relied on was gained from watching an old video, uh, cemented by his self-confidence of his view as being the only truth. <laughs> when I asked Weiberg, I was told cork, and I was also told they used leather shanks, which is the thin piece of stiff material placed inside, bridging the gap between the heel and the ball of the foot, providing arch support in that space, as well as uh, torsional rigidity. Above that filler and shank is a leather insole sewn to the uppers inside, 
And on top of that is a thick heeled arch leather sock liner with a little square of foam uh, under the heel for comfort. The vamp is lined with leather, but the shaft is unlined. The uppers are made from brown Chrome XL. If you don't know, and you probably do, but I'll tell you, if you don't know, Chrome XL is tanned by Horween Tannery in Chicago, another multi-generation family-owned company started in 1905 and now in its fifth generation of Horween family ownership. Their two flagship products are Shell Cordovan and Chrome XL. Chrome XL is a combination tanned leather that is chrome uh, tanned and then re-tanned with liquor from tree barks and then it's hot stuffed with oils in a famous 89 step process taking place over 28 days. The result is a leather with veg tanned malleable characteristics yet also with the supple and durable character of chrome tanning. Chrome XL fans will also quote the heavy pull up effect that makes it almost a self-healing leather because you can use the heat and pressure of a thumb or a finger and polish, uh, polish, polish out most of the scuffs. This is a pretty good example of Chrome XL. Halloween apparently uh, tans the hides in two pieces, front and back of the cow, and I understand uh, Viberg buys the back pieces which are firmer and, as in this example, show no deep wrinkles or the dreaded loose grain. All creases showing on the vamp and the shaft from natural wear patterns are small, fine, very crystalline lines. The clicking or leather selection is excellent. The toe is structured, again going by their Facebook post, uh, it is a leather toe puff, um, as well as an external leather heel counter at the back, covered by this one-piece backstay. The unlined tongue is partially gusseted to above uh, the second eyelet, it's sort of almost to the third eyelet. The hardware in this classic model is bright brass and a good size, allowing flat uh, wax cotton laces to go through quite easily. All eyelets though, eight of them, no speed hooks, so if you prefer speed hooks, you're out of luck in this particular model. The stitching is phenomenal. It's precise, clean, consistent, uh, again belying the work boot credentials of the maker and looking as fine as any English Northampton dress boot. Not only are there no QC issues in the stitching, just for fun, I took a pair of dividers to measure the gap uh, between the double stitching on the uppers and the variation within less than one millimeter. This is the type of stitching I'd expect on a bespoke suit. And that level of detail, precision and fineness does not make a dainty boot. The Chrome XL uses over two, nearly three millimeters thick, which is heavier than most. The all leather construction and fine but firm stitching all adds up to a 765 gram boot over three quarters of a kilogram, which is not as heavy as some PNW boots, but heavy enough and certainly heavier than the mid range Grant Stones and Oak Streets. Do not be fooled by the look. This is a sturdy quality boot. As for leather care, uh, look, I'm not going to say too much. I've dealt with uh, Chrome XL in my other videos a uh, hundred times, but if you haven't watched my Chrome XL care method, well, you'll have to subscribe and catch up on my videos. <laughs> One word, Venetian shoe cream. Anyway, uh, keep the boot clean and dust free by brushing regularly, condition when needed, maybe two or three times a year with Venetian shoe cream in neutral. Uh, but if it feels really dry, then a, a coat of liquid Neat's Foot Oil can be used. Halloween uses both products, the Neat's Foot Oil and, and Venetian, in finishing the hide. Chrome XL can be left after conditioning, but you can also polish it up if you want, and a good cream polish from Saphir or the less expensive related company Tarago. Again in neutral, I personally don't like using uh, coloured products on Chrome XL because I like the lightening patina to show through. And talking about patina, take a look at this pic showing how the same brown chrome XL lightens with the patina over time. The oldest is uh, going from right to left. So now, uh, you'll want to know how Viberg's size. Be prepared to be confused if you're American. If you're from Australia, New Zealand, Canada or the UK, or from any uh, Commonwealth country that's retained its UKness, it's simple, order true to size. I'm a UK 7.5 in average width, and this is a 7.5 in Viberg's E-width, and they fit me perfectly in the 2030 last. 
If you're American, you deserve a longer explanation because I've heard confusing and yet correct things uh, being said like, go down a full size. That's right, but it's also not right at the same time. Uh, you see, Weiberg, being from Canada, a member of the Commonwealth, uses UK sizing numbers. These are one number down from the US. Uh, so I said I was a UK seven and a half. That equates to a US uh, sizing number as eight and a half. See, one number down from the US. Same actual size, of course. My feet don't shrink in UK made boots, just that the uh, UK calls a particular measurement one number and Americans call it another number. And these are true to size. You know how people say of American boots, oh, they size large, go down a half size from your true size. Uh, the confusing thing is that many American makers make a size 8.5 boot and call it their size 8. It measures the same length, they just called it a smaller number by a half. However, some boot makers, like Oak Street boot makers for one, uh, Christian Daniel I think, casual boots certainly, um, they make their boots true to size, meaning if you measure 8.5 then buy 8.5. All that means is that if you're American, you should find out your true Brannock measured size and then convert that to Weiberg's UK sizes by going one number down. I measure a US 8.5 on the Brannock device. My Weiberg size is thus 7.5. That's why Americans will say, oh, take a full size down in your Weibergs, which could confuse the crap out of Brits. But then again, uh, they lost to us in the ashes and the cricket, so they're easily confused. <laughs> As for comfort, the 2030 last is really comfortable for me. Uh, first of all, the construction with the leather and uh, I'm assuming cork under my feet provides a good shock absorbing experience. And the way the last comes uh, quite narrow at the waist provides me with the supportive arch support. There are no build up of leather pieces under the arch as you'd see in PNW work boots, uh, but the shape of the narrower waist leads to a pushing in of the uppers there, uh, which creates good support for me. There is at least a thumb's width in front of my toes and the ball of my feet are snug but not squeezed. Uh, and even this almond toe shape, which does push in the big toe on some people, uh, in the, in, for me, it leaves me with reasonably good wiggle room. I'm quite comfortable walking around these all day, uh, except the heavier Chrome XL does rub against my ankle as the shaft is a good inch less than the normal six inches which I think would probably then, you know, cinch up better being, because it's higher up the leg. Finally, to face the elephant in the room. When new, these boots are 800 US dollars. Now that's nearly 1300 Aussie dollars. They do go on sale now and then, but that's what you're faced with. A pair of White's MP boots go for 700 US. That's a hundred less. Nick's Americana uh, is 630. I've referenced those PNW brands because I, I really don't think it's fair to compare these with, say, Oak Street trench boots or anything else in that sort of, you know, cheaper mid-range. Um, the build quality and materials is just quite different. So uh, the most expensive out of the most comparable boots and the other PNW boots are usually hand bottomed and hand stitched. While a lot of the Viberg service boot is handmade, uh, that gorgeous stitching is, I don't think, hand stitched. On the other hand, uh, as I made it abundantly clear, these will last just as long as the whites or the nicks. These are not delicate despite the dressy, fine finish. How does that add up to value? If you ignore the finishing, you'd say the Nix Americano is great value compared to these. If you do take note of the finishing, you should, I think, add a premium for that finish. And yes, I created a debate with one of my community posts on YouTube about the value of Weibergs with uh, almost equally half saying that they were worth it and the other half saying it was all just marketing hype. The price is polarizing. As a management consultant though, I can tell you that in sales, the mantra is we approach a product with our heads and then we buy with our hearts. So true. My head ticks off the material things that logic says, yeah, uh, despite the careful finish, these should sell at the same price as the MPs and the Nick's boots because they'll last just as long. But my heart says, damn it, I want a pair of these at only a hundred more because they look so cool. <laughs> Are they worth the price? 
You tell me what your heart says. So that's it. Beautiful boot. Great boot. Bit pricey. Finely made like a Savile Row suit. Tough like a work boot they used to make. Versatile because it's a casual boot, uh, but it can be worn smart as well as rugged. Tell me what you think in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to click on like. And also, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Both really help my channel and will push up my videos out uh, to more people who would like to learn about boots. If you click on like and subscribe, it's practically a public service announcement. <laughs> What's coming up next? I'm planning uh, a really interesting interview with a podiatrist about boot fitting. Don't miss that one. I also have a review of the NYX Falcon uh, collaboration with Parkers coming up. And further down the line, I'm going to do a series for people who are uh, new to quality heritage style boots and what they can afford as alternatives to expensive boots like this service boot. Subscribe and don't miss these interesting topics. Until then though, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.